Good morning. My name is John Herbst. I run the Atlanta Council's Eurasia Center. Uh, we have a wonderful event for you today. And good morning in Washington. Good afternoon in Kiev and in other European capitals. Uh, our event today is about the how it's happening in the Black Sea. We all know that Russia built up its military forces on land and at sea earlier this year. And after some strong diplomacy from the United States and other NATO countries, uh, Moscow re rebuilt, or excuse me, dropped, dropped that deployment, built down, so to speak. They built down on land, but not so much on sea. And so we have here a wonderful panel uh, to discuss what's going on in the Black Sea and the threat this represents to Ukraine. With us today are former Ukrainian Defense Minister Andriy Zaharanyuk, uh, who's now the head of the Center for Defense Strategies. We have Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, Pershing Chair for Strategic Studies at, at SIPA. We have the former Deputy Defense Minister of Ukraine, Alina Falova. And we have Admiral Retired Yehua Kabanyenko, who's also the president of the Ukrainian Advanced Research Project Agency. So we'll discuss today again the Russian buildup in the Black Sea, what that means for Ukraine and not just Ukraine. And I turn it over now to um, Andriy Zaharyuk and his team to present uh, a brief paper. Thank you, John, very much for the introduction. And uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. I will, uh, I will start with a quick remark, and then I will pass the word to, um, to the other speakers. Um, we have been studying the Black Sea situation security environment for some time, for over two years. Uh, we started that in, uh, in, um, in MOD, in Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. At that time, the, most of the attention was turned into the war in the East, obviously, uh, because of the um, activities for the last uh, seven years. And, um, and the whole attention was usually uh, focused on that. Uh, at the same time, we, have, we couldn't but notice the substantial buildup of the forces and the, generally the, uh, the very aggressive uh, and a very determined um, Russian attempt uh, to strategically control the uh, northern Black Sea uh, region. Uh, we have seen this develop, being developed over the last uh, months. Uh, and again, in April, uh, we couldn't but notice that the whole world's attention was on the, on the east, on the buildup on the land. But at the same time, majority of the focus was not very much on the, uh, on the, on the, on the maritime security. And at the same time, we believe that the, the biggest risk to Ukraine and generally to the whole security situation in the, in the region is actually coming from the sea. Because it would be very unwise for the Russia to start any uh, active uh, crossing the border and, uh, and actually open war with Ukraine uh, because of a number of reasons. So we, we, we don't think this is a, this is, it, it, does, it does make sense for them to, to do in the near future. At the same time, they could they could much easier do a, mi a military operation or or um, or other operations in the Black Sea region without uh, without actually even announcing the war, and uh, create a substantial damage, change the security dynamics, and basically, we believe that uh, we need to turn the attention of uh, governments to this, of the analysts to this. We know that there's been a number of think tanks and a number of analysts which were continuously writing about the Black Sea and continuously speaking about uh, about the Black Sea situation in the in the recent future. Oh, uh, sorry, in the recent past, and particularly General Hodges, who is with us today, uh, he's well known as the person who drew a lot of attention over the last years to the Black Sea situation. But at the same time, we don't think there is a there is a there is a full understanding of of uh, security dynamics still in the, among the governments, among the NATO. And NATO still doesn't have the strategy about the Black Sea. Uh, we know that they're going to be meeting in the, um, uh, in the, on the summits soon. We know that they're going to be discussing Black Sea, but we don't know yet uh, what would be the outcome. And at the moment, they're still deciding how to treat the Black Sea and how to treat the uh, partners, NATO partners, which are there, uh, meaning us and Georgia. So generally, the, there's a lot of unknowns still in this, in, in this situation. And, uh, and there are a lot of um, and there are a lot of like domains where the uh, where the maritime security environment actually exists. So, for example, we published the report uh, back in the, in the end of the last year, which uh, title page you see right now. We still continue those studies. The report's available on our website. It's like over eighty pages, and it covers various kind of uh, various aspects, including energy ones, including the. Uh, we believe that there is a nuclear arms in uh, Crimea already. Uh, we believe that uh, they have a very long. Uh, reaching strategy uh, for the for the domination in the in the Black Sea region, and some of the questions we'll be able to to answer during this uh, event today. Uh, so, <clears throat> so in general, we study the 
a general overview. Uh, we uh, we do a study of the NATO position. We study about the we study the potential issues with the nuclear arms. Uh, we study the uh, the tools non 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 military tools which Russia is using. Uh, we study the ongoing discussions about the response, and we give a whole set of recommendations to Ukrainian government and to the international governments on how to stabilize the situation. We do believe, and that's our main message, that the Black Sea security situation is can be only resolved uh, with the uh, joint and coherent effort of the uh, of the international community. And uh, this is not a question of Ukrainian conflict, Russian conflict with Ukraine. This is not a, 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 a the very big danger is to isolate all these issues into something like very particular, very like unrelated to the other things. This is a part of a much, much bigger, much uh, uh, strategic effort of general movement Russia to the West. And we see this in Belarus right now. We see this, we saw this in Moldova. We're seeing this as a, with the energy um, uh, projects. We see this in the Black Sea. And obviously we see this in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the east of Ukraine. So this is part of a, of a, of a one big, large kind of strategy. And that's how we should uh, approach it. And there are answers. So there are solutions to this, but, um, but the whole situation needs to be fully comprehended by the international community, and uh, its uh, its uh, threats and the uh, and the risks uh, should be like shared across the across the community. So, uh, I'll pass the floor to uh, General uh, to uh, sorry to Admiral Kabanenko and uh, then to Alina Furlova. And so, uh, Admiral will speak a little bit about the potential scenarios which we study in our reports. And uh, Alina will talk about the uh, uh, what possibly could be done, recommendations, and so on. And then we can go to the uh, and then we obviously go to General Hodges, and then we can go to the questions and answers. That's uh, uh, up to you, John. The experts of uh, the Center of Defense Strategies analyze different scenarios of military operations uh, that Russia could launch from the sea against Ukraine. Uh, they noted that exists some probability of large-scale naval operation against Ukraine as a part of uh, strategic Russia's strategic offensive, but it is clarified as low. At the same time, Ukraine has vulnerabilities on its uh, sea flanks. Moscow can use uh, them and launch an amphibious operation, a comprehensive amph amphibious operation to build a land corridor to Crimea as well as to solve the peninsula's uh, water supply problem. Uh, the probability of such an operation uh, is estimated as quite high. Uh, smaller blitzkrieg naval operations uh, may be launched by Russia, for example, operation to seize Serpent's Island as independent or as pretext uh, to more uh, intensive uh, operations. Some kind of a stabiliz stabilization uh, operation in the coastal area in order to gain military control over it, uh, followed by subsequent annexation also should be uh, considered as likely. Uh, at the same time, it should be noted that the supposed mine threat could be used as a, a pretext or a tool for escalation, as well as merchant shipping blockade. Free access to inland rivers, uh, the Dnieper River, Ukrainian, main Ukrainian river, as well as Danube River, can be exploited by Russia to conduct provocative actions or sabotage operations as well. Uh, so from our perspective, such scenarios should be uh, counted seriously. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm taking the floor and uh, well, uh, uh, Admiral just described the more focused military scenarios, but we understand in our report that we are in the hybrid warfare and uh, talking about the influence, uh, we understand that uh, not only the military uh, force can be used and not only military counter force can be used. So all the recommendations which we developed for the Ukrainian government mainly, uh, they include uh, the complex approach and they are touching the uh, multiple points and different directions. Among the key recommendations, we said that we still don't see the complex Russia strategy of Ukraine. So we have this like a neighbor uh, quite, with quite aggressive policy, with quite aggressive behavior. 
uh, in in Donbas in Crimea, and we potentially have an in, uh, could have an increase of uh, this influence from Belarusian part and so on. So we do recommend our government uh, to develop the complex Russia strategy, which will include all aspects and prognosis, and which will move uh, us to the um, uh, diplomatic and other efforts, which could lead to some uh, results in the future. Uh, the second, uh, what we do recommend, and what probably is one of the cases when uh, these recommendations are quite good um, achievable, um, this is the communications about everything, strategic communications about everything what's going on in the Black and Azov Sea. Because before this topic was mainly uh, not covered and uh, the government was more focused on Donbass area. And so we have lack of attention of international community to this region and we do recommend to focus as much as possible because we consider this uh, threat as one of the biggest ones. Uh, the third, uh, this is uh, Ukrainian intention to go to NATO and we uh, do strongly recommend to uh, find a way and to uh, keep the focus on the member uh, action plan, membership action plan, uh, which I think that we will touch today because of the uh, future NATO summit. And uh, what we also expect that the um, Ukraine will uh, highly um, recommend and participate in development of the NATO East Flank Defense Strategy, because we do consider that the um, actually, and we see that the events in Ukraine, they influence uh, quite drastically on European security. Uh, the next recommendation is about the presence of NATO um, forces and uh, in, in the Black and Azov Sea. And uh, we analyze also in the report the statistics of this presence, and we see that um, it was decreasing for many years, and now that's time to renew the presence. And plus to consider the higher presence of the, um, uh, in, which should be present in Danube River, Dniester, Southern Bug, Dnieper, and um, uh, pay special attention to the Sea of Azov. Um, next recommendation is about the um, for, to Ukrainian government to establish some kind of unified strategic command and control center, which will deal with non-military forms of aggression, uh, because still there is like a, some kind of uh, could be miscoordination or when different agencies responsible for different subjects, it can be not very covered by Ukrainian government in urgent manner if something is happening or we predict that something is happening, as well as the non-recognition policy of annexation should be more precise and uh, has some kind of common and similar principles for all of the agencies. Uh, their recommendation number six is to have a comprehensive contingency plan for possible naval blockade. Uh, because we should, not only we, but regional authorities and all the agencies should, and all the partners should understand how we will react in situation of uh, such kind of uh, um, blockade and uh, to understand the first steps uh, to counter it. Uh, next recommendation is about the Center for Maritime Crisis Management, which was actually part of the, our next study. But what we are talking about that we would like to have, and we consider that the Ukrainian government should focus on it, now the common center, joint center for operations, or maritime operations, which will include as well as the Ukrainian agency, also our partner agencies. And uh, so Ukraine also should consider uh, res uh, permanent present and allied maritime command in northward and as well as uh, raise the attention and probably to establish the working group at the international military staff in Brussels on the Black Sea security. Um, and uh, the last uh, few recommendations, this is first of all, uh, and probably the main for Ukraine is to have some kind of persistent uh, strategy on building up the naval capabilities and all our teams support the um, strategy of building up the uh, Mosquito fleet 
and we are supporters of this mosquito, mosquito fleet concept. Uh, anyway, it should include be more complex and include also the our partners' capability as well as uh, um, uh, should prioritize securing uh, should prioritize the assistance U.S. assistance which we receive and also to deliver it to uh, those capabilities. Uh, then uh, about the national shipbuilding industry, which should be restored, obviously, because Ukraine will need uh, a lot of uh, like a production and we not, don't, do not have enough budget to buy the best equipment from abroad. So we need to push up our industry. And probably the last one, but uh, also important, this is involvement of Western strategic investors into our economy especially economy of those regions which are bordering with the Black Azov Sea, because it will in somehow guarantee the presence of the, our main partners in uh, this Akvatoria and will assist Ukraine in achieving its goals. Uh, principally, this is main recommendations and we are ready to stop on them more in more detail, but I think that we will have a lot of questions and then we can just like uh, cover a lot of them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alina. Um, I'm going to turn to Ben Hodges, but before I do that, I want to ask a question to Admiral Kavanenko. Uh, what is the current disposition of Russian ships in the Sea of Azov and in the Black Sea? And have that, has that number dropped as the Russians dropped their deployment on land over the past several weeks? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your question. Uh, as well known, what uh, huge Russian military build up in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov in March, April this year uh, did not end with their withdrawal, as it was promised by a Minister of Defense, Russian Minister of Defense. And the increased number of uh, ships, uh, naval assets, uh, land uh, forces uh, on the peninsula. Uh, 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 didn't uh, uh, decrease uh, in this time. And uh, in this regard, I, I would stress what um, attention should be paid on to one, um, from my perspective, important detail moment. Uh, the existing composition of the surface forces of the Black Sea Fleet was seriously reinforced in uh, March and April by the landing ships. Uh, and boats uh, from uh, the Northern Fleet, Russian Northern Fleet, the Baltic Fleet, as well as uh, Caspian Flotilla. Uh, uh, this and the nature of Russian uh, military activities in the region indicates that Russia maintains a significant offensive uh, component potential there uh, and a high degree of its combat uh, and uh, operational readiness. So, I think what, uh, and uh, we can see this right now, uh, the current status of uh, op operational activities, current status of uh, training drills, exercises, and see uh, the evidence about uh, 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 real preparation for some offensive actions. Uh, and I think from my perspective, we should count this very seriously. Okay, thank you. Um, ben, uh, you're actually, I'd say the Dean of Western analyst of what's happening in the Black Sea. So I'd appreciate your reaction to the report and its recommendations. Well, sir, thank you. Um, a good report. And uh, these are three people that just spoke that for whom I have an awful lot of respect. And um, I didn't hear anything with which I would uh, disagree. Um, but there are, I think, three points that, that I would want to make. Uh, first of all, um, it is going to be a very bad, long, hot summer uh, for Ukraine uh, and in the Black Sea region. Uh, I think the uh, Admiral is exactly right. Almost nothing left. Um, Minister Shoigu um, has perpetuated the fairy tale that this surge six, six weeks ago was just an exercise and they all went back to the barracks. Uh, no, no second lieutenant at Fort Benning would believe that for a second that, these, that those guys are gone. Um, it's all there. But, you know, I live here in Frankfurt and I could hear the sighs of relief from Berlin and Brussels and Paris when they thought, okay, good, the crisis is over. And of course, that's exactly what the Kremlin wants is for people to think that the crisis is over uh, because they know that all of Europe goes on summer holiday in August. 
and Germany is going to be focused on the elections in September. And so um, I, I obviously I hope I'm wrong, but I am very concerned that what's going to be happening uh, at the end of August and in September is just going to be the next the next uh, step, if you will. Uh, the the second thing, the Russians will only stop when they are stopped. Uh, they, they're never going to say, okay, we've, we've got enough. We don't need to do any more. Uh, what we're seeing right now is a continuation of what started in 2008 with their invasion of Georgia. And they saw that the West did nothing. And they still occupy 20% of Georgia. And then they saw that the West did nothing after uh, the Assad regime uh, stepped over President Obama's red lines. Uh, we, we didn't do anything. The U.S., U.K., France. Uh, and then, of course, we really haven't done anything to influence Russian behavior since 2014. NATO has gotten better. NATO has made adjustments. Uh, EU sanctions may have slowed down Russian modernization, but clearly uh, we've done nothing to inflict any pain and cause real uh, change of behavior. Um, and, and so what, what we're seeing is just continued stair-stepping of Russian uh, pressure. Now, the um, I think this would be my third point. We, we've got to figure out a way to get, how do we get the initiative in the Black Sea region? Uh, of course, there will be people who will be very reluctant to do anything that looks provocative, but th that is such a um, ineffective way to look at Russia. They don't need provocation. The, the, the biggest provocation to them is when we look unprepared and, and like when they can see that we're not going to do anything, that provokes them to keep going. So I think finding a way to uh, get the initiative there, uh, exercises, for example. Sea Breeze is coming up here in about two weeks. Um, it's going to be the biggest, I think it's going to be one of the largest Sea Breeze exercises in quite some time. Uh, I would like to see us uh, combine Sea Breeze with a couple of other exercises, make it something on a significant scale that really exercises joint multinational capabilities. I think we need to figure out as part of getting the initiative, how do we um, change the economic dynamic? You know, this is this is about great power competition and you have to compete in the economic domain as well. So Georgia and uh, Ukraine um, have got to make themselves uh, more attractive to investment. Because right now there's no serious German, French or American business in Ukraine or Georgia. I mean, there's some, but not big. And so because of that, they don't have any skin in the game, and, and that's why I think there's a uh, a lack of interest. I think that's what Andre used that phrase or something like that. It's they're not interested, and uh, so part part of this competition has to be economic. All right, thank you, thank you, Andre. Uh, I'll turn to you now. Uh, we have you, your your paper spotlight potential Kremlin actions threats coming from the sea. What do you see as the main one that Ukraine needs to focus on? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John. And I, and I do agree with everything which General Hodges said. Uh, yes, we do think that vested interest, as we call it in, in the report of the international nations and their, and their large capital would definitely be a, would definitely be something which would impact uh, positively the security. Uh, we also have to remind, and we study this right now as a part of our uh, ongoing strategic studies that in the history when we had a large capital investments upcoming from Exxon and from Shell to the uh, to the energy uh, security that caused a lot of attention from the uh, from from Russia and actually but possibly have uh, um, impacted the timing of the uh, of the Crimean annexation uh, because uh, because obviously they realized as soon as uh, large corporations are present in the in the region there their power, including lobbying power, uh, is uncompared. Uh, was uncomparable with the with the with the power of and the, and the weight of Ukraine at that time. Anyway, we do see a number of uh, threats. First of all, we do think that escalation of the tensions in the Black Sea is very probable. Uh, we do see that on number of uh, number of um, uh, indicators, and uh, potentially uh, the the most the riskiest part uh, at the moment. Uh, apart from the Sea of Azov, which is de facto is already uh, controlled by Russia. So uh, the riskiest part is the trading, trading routes to Odessa. And uh, that, that, that part of the, 
of the steel con uh, of the Black Sea, which is still controlled by the um, by the Ukrainian government, and which is a lifeline of Ukrainian economy, because as you know, all agriculture, metals, and all other imports and exports are going through the sea, specifically through that sort of corridor. And uh, the embargo operations or some some similar ones in that region uh, could be done with a much less effort, with much less capability than any land operations, and uh, at the same time create a substantial substantial damage. And the answer to that, there are solutions to this, and there are solutions which are shared by the international community, with expert community, with the diplomatic community, and so on. The question is that they have to be implemented, uh, and uh, the, the the threat is absolutely imminent. Thank you. Well, when you when you talk about that threat, uh, I mean, Moscow obviously has uh, illegally annexed Crimea and therefore claimed the territorial waters around the peninsula. Uh, how 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 would they be able? I mean, physically they move their ships into the core you're talking about, but wouldn't they be subject to substantial international condemnation and, and sanctions? Well, yes. After that happens, and uh, international condemnation will take some time to understand what's going on. And that's why one of our recommendations is, create, is to create a situational center and situational uh, like coordination headquarters in order to, to uh, game play and basically foresee scenarios and prepare the answers before these scenarios happen. Because what usually happens is that something, something is going on and then international community takes time to understand and, uh, and so on. I have to remind concerning the territorial so-called territorial waters of Crimea, which obviously are, is an artificial uh, term, Right. Um, the uh, the gas stations, the gas rigs of uh, they are outside of that of that region, and they are not part of that uh, of that region, and they're still controlled by Russia. And also, I have to say that the Russia is constantly closing the the chunks of the Black Sea outside of those borders for so-called um, uh, exercises and uh, various other military activities, which often does not even take do not even take place. Uh, but basically, they, they they disrupt the the shipping through those uh, through those uh, sort of means. That's actually could be considered as a, some sort of a hybrid innovation, in the, because because that's something which came up re fairly recently. We cover that in the report as well. But um, yeah, so so essentially, it's not necessarily you have to uh, you have to open a serious military activity in order to disrupt shipping shipment. But the economic effect, the political effect of those would be uh, would be dramatic. So we have to be aware of that, and we have to be ready to to, to take the action. Um, one point that might be relevant here: my recollection is that in the first year or two after uh, the seizure of Crimea, uh, Moscow was also not just interfering with, but actually taking control of uh, Ukrainian hydrocarbon installations in the territorial waters of the rest of Ukraine. But then they abandoned those positions. Uh, it's against my understanding of what happened. Do you see that as a precedent for what might happen now? Okay, <clears throat> the, Russia is extremely worried about any uh, economic developments in the energy sector in the Black Sea. And uh, as I mean, we have not been seeing this as a, one of the uh, sort of uh, points which, 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 which uh, as I said, they triggered potentially triggered the timing of the escalation in uh, sorry the annexation in Crimea, but also they they're quite <clears throat> sort of aggressive about anything uh, because the Black Sea potentially the generally the, the energy potential of the region is absolutely undervalued and it's underestimated. It's it's actually quite big, and uh, uh, if you know if you may remember in 2011 2012 uh, companies like Shen Chevron Exxon and so on. They were planning to invest billions of of, uh, of dollars into the into the region. Question is that if they if they didn't estimate the potential, why would be doing these investments? Obviously, they uh, they understand that the potential is huge. So does Russia. So they do whatever possible to undermine the the uh, first of all the independence of uh, energy independence of Ukraine, and secondly, they want to prevent Ukraine to actually uh, become uh, become. An, uh, import negative and actually become uh, exporter of the uh, of the of the hydrocarbons. So yes, the energy dimension of the of the of this whole issue is huge, and um, yes, it has to be looked uh, quite significant. But yeah, so probably that's okay. it. Yeah. Thank you. Pursuing the same theme of the economic side of the, of the Kremlin uh, naval presence, Alina, you referred to the disruption of shipping in the Sea of Azov. How dangerous has this? First of all. How does Moscow accomplish this, and how dangerous is this for Ukraine? 
Well, accomplishment unfortunately was made also because of our miscoordination, because we still have a special regime in the Azov Sea uh, due to our agreement, which actually uh, considers this Azov Sea as the internal sea, some kind of considers uh, internal sea. So Russia use it like a fully. They can uh, uh, close to our uh, to our cost, like um, almost uh, uh, deliver their troops there without any um, interference, let's say, or objections from international powers. And that uh, one needs also to be stopped. We know about the bridge. We know about the blockage, which they do. We have all these statistics of how long they keep in the ships there. Uh, they do not allow the trade ships to enter the Azov Sea. And of course, any commercial operations, they will think twice before go with this route, uh, as well as the black seals, because um, uh, you're losing time, you're losing money, and this is not direct, but stop of the economic activity there. Uh, what Ukrainian forces uh, usually do, they try to um, a company or uh, the, the, the commercial ships with some kind of naval forces, but that doesn't work well always. Uh, but what I would like to pay any attention and to show like uh, Andrew was like talking about the steps which can be taken. So uh, due to last um, uh, due to last escalation, which we had, you know, that some petrol, uh, petrol boats of UK and US came into the Black Sea. And what they were doing, they were just cruising between the gas, uh, gas stations and actually demonstrating with this that the international uh, ships and trade ships can use these routes and Russians were not reacting. I mean that it was enough like a few patrol boards to keep the balance on some other level. So this is actually the practical steps which can be taken. But what we have now, we have a, a substantial decrease in of course the transportation from Azov Sea. Uh, the and uh, we really have a huge threat to uh, have this like uh, we already have a substantial decrease in black sea, but we have this huge risk of closing the uh, um, commercial routes in, in the black sea. And uh, the another issue I would like also to say that um, Admiral Kabanenko was mentioning it about the mines, uh, mine danger. So. Uh, as soon as uh, no one can control now the mining in the region. We perfectly understand that it can be some kind of provocation with mines, with any commercial ship. And uh, that would be like just like made no Russians, but um, it, it can lead to complete stop of all the operation on the routes. Um, that's somehow the situation how it is. Thank you. Uh, Admiral, uh, Alina re you know, referred back to the, the issue of mines. What would be the, uh, what would be Ukraine's reaction if in fact we see mines um, in place? Oops, I, uh, maybe I should have um, Andre answer this. Sorry, can, um, I have a, can you, can you repeat please? Because I, I thought that yes. would be. Um, I, Alina referred to mines, which is something that Admiral Kabinenko also brought up. Yeah. So, I mean, the introduction of mines would be a radical step, a major, major escalation. What would Ukraine's reaction to this be? Um, I'm sorry, I have a disruption of the signal. Can you can you say the introduction of what? Sorry for that. The if, if Moscow were actually to put mines into the Sea of Azov oh. or into the Black Sea, mm -hmm. that would be a major escalation. Uh, what would Ukraine's reaction to this be? Well, of course, uh, again, we uh, th there's a whole number of scenarios what they can do, and uh, right. that's obviously would be uh, that's obviously would be uh, uh, one of them. And uh, because we 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 see their activity on the uh, on the infrastructural uh, uh, elements of the infrastructure in the Black Sea, we do consider that they may be installing some uh, even equipment. We have seen, for example that uh, they've been using the uh, so-called scientific explorations and scientific work in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov actually for their reconnaissance and for intelligence purposes. 
So there is a there was a misuse of civilian fleet for the for the military purposes and so on. Uh, and a number of analysts and uh, us, including, we are tracing the situation in the Black Sea on a sort of open source, and we we we, we see all these kind of weird movements about this. Ukraine has to turn the attention. Uh, of uh, of international community, Ukraine has to strengthen its fleet. So actually, those recommendations are quite obvious, and um, and uh, they're not uh, um, they're not something new. Uh, and but uh, but certainly the uh, certainly some of them uh, could be implemented much faster, I would say. And uh, we do see a delay in the response for many many of these of these activities. All right, thank you. Um, um, Ihar, I'd like to come, come back to you now. Uh, you, you talked about the, the threat posed by amphibious operations. Uh, when, you know, when you had the Russian buildup earlier this year, uh, most analysts, myself included, focused on Mariupol and the water canal north of Crimea. How, how would amphibious uh, troops be used, for example, in connection with the canal? Yeah, uh, from from my perspective, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I don't think uh, what the conditions uh, uh, exist right now for large-scale Russian strategic invasion uh, invasion operation. At the same time, uh, uh, some kind of local operation are likely uh, uh, combined by threats, uh, blackmail, and the use of uh, fifth column uh, in. Uh, uh, coastal areas or uh, of Ukrainian coastal areas. Uh, this is so-called Russian uh, uh, style of new type uh, warfare. In this regard, the southern direction of for Ukraine uh, has a number of vulnerabilities. Uh, what can be expo uh, exploited by Kremlin? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Russia's significant superiority of the Ukrainian naval forces. And means uh, as well as significant uh, number of uh, areas available on our coastline available for landing on the uh, from the from the sea. So uh, uh, we are talking about the threat of Moscow, uh, not just a traditional uh, uh, amphibious operation, but comprehensive sea airborne uh, operation against Ukraine which may also involve uh, Russian troops in, in, in the Donbass and their efforts to keep air domination uh, as, a, as, a, as a part of uh, such operation. I think the uh, North Crimean uh, Canal may uh, become a pretext uh, for an invasion from the sea and uh, Kremlin uh, justification, let's say, of such invasion may be uh, accompanied by information uh, campaign and the slogan operation to prevent uh, humanitarian crisis in Crimea um, and so on. So sabotage activities uh, are predict predictable as well. So uh, from my perspective, uh, the uh, probability of such operation is higher, uh, is higher because uh, mentioned uh, aspects. And in this regard, I think also stress what uh, support and help uh, from uh, Western partners, from NATO partners, and uh, uh, probably uh, the, I think is seriously about uh, possibility to uh, create some, some formation for targeted joint naval activities in the region. This is not only about the uh, periodic presence in the region of the naval forces of NATO countries, the US naval forces, uh, uh, but about joint operations. Uh, according to an agreed plan. I think this is time right now to, to, to think seriously about this. In such operation, Ukrainian naval uh, forces could uh, uh, provide, could carry out a supplementary if uh, uh, NATO uh, naval forces activities here. Uh, first of all, uh, the US naval activities in the Black Sea region. Um, you know, I think that point you made is picking up on what Ben had said earlier. So Ben, I'd like to give you, 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 Ben, you mentioned earlier about the need to make the current small exercises that the US and others are conducting in the Black Sea more systematic, combine it with others. So why don't you elaborate on that point here? Uh, yeah, I, I think that we have a lot of uh, possibilities, even under existing uh, programs of our cooperation, cooperation with NATO and uh, cooperation with the US 
and this is not only about uh, uh, a traditional uh, sea breeze naval exercise. I think the the they can uh, just uh, uh, launch a, 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 a special breeze for special operation for naval space seals for special operation forces for uh, other naval assets and also. Uh, Alina spoke uh, about uh, mosquito fleet. And in this regard, I think they also need some uh, experience of uh, NATO states, how to, not only how to build uh, such capabilities, but how to train personnel, how motivate personnel. Uh, and of course, it's a question of uh, so some kind of uh, naval culture that should be implemented, it should be uh, uh, implemented inside our naval forces for effective operations uh, here. So a lot of uh, uh, possibilities exist for training. And also I would also mention uh, orbital uh, exercises, orbital uh, group for training of our naval forces uh, and other uh, possibilities. Uh, and in this regard, I also would stress what probably we, we should think about the possibility to, to more intensively use our uh, uh, south and uh, training ranges, firing ranges, Sherkalanivsky Polygon and other uh, uh, training uh, ranges for joint training, for joint training and as a, uh, some kind of basis for, for uh, further, for advanced training and so on. Okay, thank you. Ben, back to you now. So, um... I would love to see, for example, a, uh, an exercise <clears throat> where US, Romanian, and Polish ground forces were invited by Ukraine to come participate in an exercise in Sharkilan, as uh, the Admiral just talked about. This is the large training area down near Kherson, um, and also, of course, in uh, near uh, Lviv, the um, Yavariv training area. And, and the idea would be to drive from Romania, from Poland, into Ukraine, to do convoys, uh, just as if we were responding to uh, a crisis or trying to prevent a crisis. Um, I think there are some serious military mobility challenges uh, for moving around inside of Ukraine and moving from the West into Ukraine. So th this, is a, this is something that I think <clears throat> we would want to exercise. Of course, totally transparent, invite Russian observers, uh, all of that. But that, would, that, to me, would be a great way to combine a land uh, exercise with a naval exercise, as the Admiral talked about, making it a joint exercise. And by the way, Ukraine is not an island. Um, combine this with an exercise in Georgia at the same time. I mean, the whole point is to force the Kremlin to look in multiple directions, to have them react to us instead of us always reacting to them. And, and I think um, exercises are part of the way to do this. Now, I would also um, think about, you know, with all, with all due respect, when every time I hear about mosquito fleet, all right, that's, that's a platform, right? Those, those are boats. To do what? I mean, if, if I'm a young Ukrainian naval officer and I'm the commander of, a, of one of these vessels, which would be cool, I would love to do that, by the way. Uh, if the Admiral will let me um, do that, I will, I will give it a try. Um, but what's my mission? I mean, really, am I gonna be allowed to, to use force and I shoot at Russian vessels? I mean, the last time Ukrainian uh, vessels went out against the Black Sea Fleet uh, back in November of uh, 18, okay. I mean, it, it turned out terrible because I think those uh, young sailors, uh, we didn't have a mission or rules of engagement. And so um, I, I would want to know what is, the, um, what is the mission that you expect for these uh, very small vessels. Uh, the third thing I would, I would recommend is, um, you know, the U.S. Navy is putting a lot of money into unmanned maritime systems, basically drones for the water. 
And these are particularly effective against submarines, against mines, and um, you know, if and they're not as expensive, obviously, as surface vessels with crews, and they don't have the same overhead requirement. Um, if Ukraine and Romania together, for example, um, had unmanned systems uh, that could make the commander of the Black Sea Fleet feel very uncomfortable in his uh, illegal base in Sevastopol. I, I think this is something that uh, would be worth exploring. Okay, a provocative idea. All right, we, we have uh, several questions on relating to Turkey and its role. So uh, let, me, let me ask Alina if she can take a shot at that and now come to Andre after that. Uh, Roger Higgins has asked, given the country's border in the Black Sea, does not the panel consider Turkey to be important uh, concerning how best to contain Russia? And also, um, Oryx Sabadas talks about the impact of Turkey's rapprochement with Russia, but in fact, there's also been a rapprochement between Ukraine and Turkey. So how does Turkey factor into Ukrainian thinking on defending itself at sea? Well, I think that the Ukraine, uh, Turkish factor is principal one. I mean, that uh, the Turkish forces are the biggest forces there were before Russians started to, to make all the preparations and escalations. So in principle, of course, of Montreux Convention, Turkey influence uh, a lot at the um, all the situation in the Black and the Sea. And I think that, and actually, when we were in the ministry, we started this um, like a movement to special relations to Turkey, because we have a very strong factor, uh, which we have in Turkey. This is the huge diaspora of Crimean Tatars, and this is the very big political uh, influence which not very well used, well, was not very well used before by Ukraine. And I do believe that the Turkish diplomacy, yeah, they have like a little bit different manner of diplomacy than uh, Western, old Western countries, but um, democracies, but um, they can balance situation quite significantly. And Russians also understand this because you saw uh, what was the reaction of Putin when Turkey said that they will support the Crimea platform as an initiative. So um, Putin called a few times to Erdogan to talk to him and like send him messages with some kind of quite aggressive negative uh, reflections on it. So the, the Turkish position is principal. Uh, we cannot. Uh, let's say for 100% be sure that uh, uh, they will uh, always be on the side of Ukraine, let's say so. Uh, but I'm absolutely sure that uh, balancing the relation with them and having more connection with Turkey and having more coordinated um, uh, approach with Turkey would bring a lot of stabilization to the region. And I think that probably this is one of the lines which is now under the realization of uh, it started like a two years ago and now it's emphasized. We have, you know, appointments in presidential administration, which uh, like a former, our former ambassador in Turkey, we have a special advisor to the prime minister in Turkey. So plus some kind of economic agreements, which uh, seems to be uh, like a right line of establishing some special relations. The other issue is the relation of Turkey within NATO. And I think that this also be the, uh, should be a question which should be, um, because for many years, it's like everybody make view that everything is okay, although everybody understand that there are some issues to discuss. And I think it's time and the Black Sea escalation is like a good time to start to discuss these uh, problems or questions which uh, uh, Turkey and NATO have inside and probably to find the new way of solving them using this opportunity because we really do need. Um, I saw also the um, uh, questions about Georgia and I think that we shouldn't forget uh, the Georgia and all this uh, modification and component. And I do believe that together with Georgia, we also can move a lot, uh, the rise up the question as well as to make any regional um, compositions and cooperation with Romania, with Bulgaria, with whoever who has like a even small presence in the Black Sea, it will bring more voice into the NATO, uh, more Ukrainian position into the NATO and 
more um, of that approach which uh, um, General Hodges just said when we have a multiple points of efforts, which will mean the multiple points of attention for Russia. Thank you. I think General Hodges also has something to say about Turkey. Ben, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy that so many people asked about Turkey. And uh, I, of course, I agree completely with what Alina just said. You know, part of our problem in the U.S. and the West is that we don't have a strategy for the Black Sea region. You can't have a policy for Ukraine or a policy for Turkey if you don't have a strategy for the region. And when the president said, you know, Ukrainian sovereignty is a priority for the United States, that is a powerful um a powerful policy statement, but there's no strategy that underpins it, that puts resources there, explains how we're gonna compete in all the domains. And I'm afraid it's even worse when it comes to Turkey. Uh, people talk about Turkey as if it's an enemy state or uh, it's an island somehow. Uh, now, I, I don't excuse some really bad decisions uh, by our Turkish allies, but they have been an ally since 1952. And uh, if you just take one quick look at the map, not only are they critical for the Black Sea, but they also are critical for containing Iran and Islamic extremism. It's, it is such an important part of the map, but it's always down in the bottom right-hand corner of the map. And so I think the administration has got to think about how do we rebuild trust with our Turkish allies? How, how do we, um, look, they, they have a history with Russia that's not a very good one, uh, they depend on a, a lot from Russia. So um, I can understand some of the things that they do. But if we were competing there, if we were seriously competing in economic and diplomatic and information space uh, and thinking strategically about the important role of Turkey, I think we would have done things uh, quite differently. Uh, I love that Ukraine and Turkey are starting to uh, cooperate on uh, arms industry. Um, I think Turkey is beginning to feel a little bit more confident. Uh, I think Poland and Turkey also, this is a very, very old relationship that goes back centuries. Um, so I, I guess the point is the nations of the Black Sea have got to work together. You can't have Ukraine, Romania, Turkey, Georgia as separate entities because there's, you won't have any effect in Washington or in Brussels. But if the voices, if the nations of the Black Sea put their voices together and draw attention in Washington and in Brussels to the strategic importance of the Black Sea, I think we have a chance to, uh, to elevate attention, investment, and uh, yeah, and pressure. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Bob McConnell. He says that most of the recommendations for the report presented today are direct to the government of Kiev. Um, and what is the sense of how these recommendations will be received or acted upon? Um, Andre, you want to give that a shot? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, obviously, it's a, <clears throat> it's a, always a complex situation because every conference, every report uh, contains recommendations, and then everybody's expecting Ukrainian government straight, like jump on it and straight and implement straight away. It never happens, uh, but. Uh, it never happens that way, but uh, we do see uh, uh, a, a very serious and a very, uh, I would say, unprecedented uh, openness of the government right now to the, uh, uh, to the independent opinion. Um, we have, for example, the Crimean platform. It's a famous sort of like a well-known, well-publicized in Ukraine endeavor. But uh, most of that is based on the uh, development, on the, on the research and developments which have been done by the think tanks. And... Um, and we will work with the, the part of the platform. We're actually working uh, uh, specifically on the security uh, security part, and that includes economic security and uh, energy security and so on. But uh, um, yes, so they are open. And uh, we work with MFA, for example, and we work with NSDC, and uh, they constantly require more and more content in order to, and as you see, NSDC is, is publishing the uh, uh, many decisions uh, regularly on uh, on various subjects and including NATO integration, including the uh, including security issues. So it's a it's a great window of opportunity to actually uh, um, to actually bring up uh, some of those of those questions uh, and some of those solutions. Uh, we uh, all, always there's a feeling that the reform goes painfully slow. That's true. Still, uh, we still see that. Uh, uh, lots of things which are 
oh, honestly like low hanging fruits now i mean there are a lot of law, laws which we which which needed to be passed some time ago that are still not passed or not implemented or uh or the strategy for example naval strategy developed in 2018 uh, 19 uh, is implemented not exactly as it was written but uh still the ukrainian government is is sort of uh, uh especially on international especially on maritime right now on a political maritime level they are uh they are hearing uh hearing the independent uh, expert voice so it's uh, so i believe uh, uh, the time spent here and the time spent on on uh, doing our research uh and we're doing and we're doing we're doing 12, doing 12 topics uh on a crimean platform so i don't i don't think this is a, a wasted time um honestly Okay, I think it will, it will work out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Ambassador Bill Taylor. Uh, is the threat of a move against the Crimean water canal higher than the threat to shipping lanes into and out of Odessa? Um, Admiral, you want to give that a, sh quick, give that a shot? Uh, yes, from my perspective, it's uh, uh, quite a uh, risk of, uh, of threat is quite higher. And uh, 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 Sure, uh, it could be used. It, it may used by Russia uh, not only for as a as a separate operation, but a pretext of much more intensive operations in this area. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's based on uh, you know Russia is count our vulnerabilities in in uh, in uh, at sea and in the coastal areas and uh, available again uh, available for landing um, um, areas uh, of our coastline and of course uh, if you have superiority if you have uh, domination at sea you you uh, uh, can plan some some actions against your rival your enemy and they can see that from russian side and the real preparation because for example last exercises at sea uh, and it's uh, above at sea and, and at land, at the land, uh, Crimean land, it's uh, in uh, Apuk uh, training range area. Uh, all of those exercises is a real, they are real preparation for, for such some kind of amphib amphibious sections, uh, uh, sea airborne operations and so on. So the threat of this is high, I, I, I think. Uh, Operations uh, of blockade of uh, blockade of uh, merchant shipping. Uh, so Russia demonstrate uh, these kind of operations uh, right now. For example, if we would count uh, uh, recent events uh, with the Russian buildup and demonstration of its uh, military muscles uh, in uh, in uh, March and April, Russia has worked out blockade actions against Berdyansk and Mariupol, for example, it's well-known Ukrainian force in the Sea of Azov, as well as a force in the Ukrainian naval assets, uh, the Sea of Azov uh, into the port zone. Uh, this is some kind of a preparation for a more, more active operation operations and a more precise operation in the Black Sea as well. They are the only have a very narrow corridor for, for uh, Russia just uh, create a very narrow corridor for merchant shipping between uh, Serpent Island and the uh, last occupied uh, gas rig uh, Tavrida. So one more important aspect, what I, what I should stress, what I, what I think to uh, what you pay more attention is that uh, uh, some kind of new, uh, well known, for example, what uh, Russia uh, just uh, created the uh, strategy, Balkan Stikato strategy, aimed at strangely, strangely Ukraine's merit, uh, maritime economy in the Sea of Azov. And uh, now Russia demonstrates uh, the uh, more deeper, uh, you know, approach, uh, which was uh, uh, demonstrated on April, uh, on the first decade of April, uh, their uh, vessels delays at the Kerch uh, Strait entrance, uh, uh, entrance increased uh, up to three days. It is two times more compared to the same period in 2020. So uh, uh, also uh, uh, the merchant shipping blocking by Russia took place on April 15, uh, 14 and 15. Then Ukrainian gunboats approached to Kerch Strait. 
So uh, there are uh, some kind of examples of the international uh, maritime law violation as well as well-known uh, 2003 Russian Ukraine agreement, uh, not only for economic, not, not, only, only, not only to achieve economic goals, but also to provide domination, domination uh, to build uh, well-known uh, Russian plans to build uh, this year of uh, internal lake of Russian internal lake. I think what such kind of threats exist in in the uh, northern uh, western part of, of uh, the Black Sea. Uh, so uh, the situation is not, not uh, easy uh, right now. And uh, Russia still continue to uh, work out different actions, different operations to uh, block, if necessary, if needed for Russian aims, for Russian goals uh, to block uh, merchant shipping. And in this regard, uh, common operations with our partners, uh, like was recently with OPVs of uh, the United States and the United Kingdom is uh, vital. And uh, this uh, experience of such operations should, should be learned and uh, for the operations in this regard, uh, operations to provide freedom of navigation should be, should be continued. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Jim McCarthy. Uh, We've, you've talked about in your recommendations the um, hybrid nature of the Russian threat. Uh, we haven't really talked so much about cyber. So Jim McCarthy says, how could Russian possibly disrupt the infrastructure and logistics of the region via cyber attacks? And of course, he, ref he, re he references the, sp the spate of cyber attacks on the United States over the past several weeks coming from entities in Russia. So Alina, do you want to give that a question a chance? Oh, yes, so uh, we actually suffering from cyber attacks every day. So we have a uh, like official statistics, which say in like uh, multiple cases daily on many uh, Ukrainian state and non state institutions. And principally, we understand that we are quite still are quite open for these attacks. And uh, so the infrastructure, yes, you saw the, we saw the like a few years ago, this massive attacks on electric stations, um, uh, and which we consider they were testing attacks. So the, that was not like um, real, even real force, full force attacks. So the, of course, uh, the infrastructure can be harmed with uh, cyber. Uh, of course, we need to do more with this. And plus, I'm absolutely sure that in this regard, Ukraine can share a lot of experience with our partners, because what we see now in US and in all other states, this is the, um, let's say, um, high level of readiness in from the um, general like IT infrastructure and knowledge, but low level of uh, knowledge of what the Russians are planning and uh, how do they approach to all this stuff and what are the trends and uh, what do they develop in, in current situation in Ukraine. Uh, keeping in mind that we are perf in the same um, like a language, uh, we speak the same language, we understand the same context, uh, um, uh, we, we have a lot of interconnections between Ukrainian and Russian specialists in IT. So Ukraine can deliver a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of prognosis and trends uh, to our Western partners. Uh, but uh, yes, this is one of the, let's say, biggest uh, issue. And I um, unfortunately, I cannot say that Ukraine is fully ready to uh, counter it and to deter Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions relating to the upcoming meeting between President Biden and President Putin. I will take the one from Georgi Muchaidze, and forgive me if I mispronounced your last name, although I think I got it. And his question is to General Hodges. The question goes like this. Um, there is an opinion in expert community, I guess in some places in that community, that vis-a-vis -vis Russia, President Biden speaks like Reagan and acts like Obama. Do you think this opinion has some ground? And does the initiation of an early meeting with Putin at least partly validate this fear? And what might you expect to come from that meeting? Well, uh, a great question. And uh, I have to say, I have been disappointed in the last uh, several weeks with some of the, the uh, policy decisions taken by the administration. I mean, after a roaring start, you know, the comment about Ukrainian sovereignty and yes, Putin is a killer uh, since then. It hasn't been uh, 
uh, quite as robust. And I know that many of our allies, as well as partners in Central and Eastern Europe and around the Black Sea are worried that they're going to be uh, pawns, that they're going to be, um, I mean, something like, for example, the fact that the uh, missile defense system at Devicello in Romania might be on the table is, is uh, incredible to me. But um, I hope, obviously, that the president uh, looks him right in the eye and says, hey, look, you've done this. You know, you've messed with our elections. You've killed people. Uh, you are violating international law every day. You're killing Ukrainian soldiers almost every week. And it's going to stop now. And we're going to inflict so much pain on you that you won't know what hit you. But he's got to he's got to do that. You can't just say, OK, look, Russia, uh, you're a uh, a uh, fading power. That, I think that's a very dangerous approach to think that Russia is is just a small um, uh yeah, fading power that, that still has nuclear weapons and still has a significant military and is willing to do, uh, to use all of that. And I think we would be um, forfeiting uh, an opportunity here if, if he is not really crystal clear. Now, what I do expect that, you know, this is pretty good lineup, G7, EU, NATO. So when he meets with President Putin, he'll have had time to speak with um, all of his fellow heads of state and government that he needs to. So he should be very confident going in there to uh, see the president of the Russian Federation. Okay, thank you. And Ben, while you're speaking, others have picked up on what you're saying. And, and I have a question from Chris Lamel. He asks, um, do you think um, that Russia will lead towards China? Um, as we respond to Russian aggression? No, I think that um, Russia and China obviously talk to each other, but I, I have not seen um, evidence of any kind of strong collaboration. I think it's more opportunist. I think that if the United States gets into a kinetic conflict with China in the next five or six years, which I do think is a possibility, uh, then Russia would exploit that. And uh, um, would would take advantage of us being distracted somewhere else, and vice versa. Uh, but but I, I I don't see them collaborating in in a significant way. Okay, um, I, I I will jump jump out jump out of my role as moderator and say I agree with you. And I wrote an article for the National Interest last August talking about Chinese territorial claims on Russia, right. which people don't pay much attention to. Okay. <laughs> We have a question from um, Peter Mintun, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. The question is this, Russia is claiming maritime jurisdiction in conflict with international law and conventions in both the Black Sea and the Barents Sea. The security environment in the two regions might seem different. The means and strategy employed, however, by Russia follows the same line of approach. Do you see any link between the two regions with regard to the international approach and peaceful solution? Um, Andre, would you like to give us a chat, take a shot at this? Uh, yes, we started that and we continue starting this and uh, we can give also the chance to comment for Tualina because this is uh, one of the subjects which we consider as very interesting and uh, we spent some time on uh, looking at that. Yes, Russia is innovating a lot of hybrid technologies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, sort of tools in the Black Sea and generally about Ukraine, which then it applies to the rest of the world. And uh, for example, you have um, Pete absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, there are similarities and uh, there will be similarities because Russia is extending its ambitions to Arctic uh, um, very actively and it will continue doing so. And uh, the same thing is in the Far East. So we generally think that uh, uh, looking across the world, where, how it behaves in, a, uh, in a different places, uh, we'll, we'll be finding more and more of those similarities. And uh, the, uh, uh, the reaction of the world and the proactive activities of the world in one region could be good lessons learned for the other regions. Absolutely. So, so as, as we said, the, we, the, the, the biggest mistake the international community can make is to isolate these issues and think that, well, if we somehow pacify Russia or, 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 or kind of not upset it in one, in one region, that would be it. That would be all. No, because they will be doing exactly the same thing. 
uh, that will reinforce their, reinforce their uh, activities in, 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 including in some other regions. So yeah, there are similarities. There will, there will be. Okay, Elena, do you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that this is not only the um, actions of Russia. So Russia is testing the international order and international law. It finds the gaps there in international law, or maritime law, or freedom of navigation, or whatever, or like a claim and exercises. It starts to use it actively as a, a part of its hybrid actions. And the threat of this is that not only Russia is watching it, I mean that many other countries who are ready to um, approach in the same way in their territorial disputes or in their behavior in the sea, uh, they uh, using it. And we had, for example, discussion with our Japanese colleagues who were saying that they see the same actions of the, like uh, the same actions, the same type of action from China in, in their seas. So in their like a conflict territories. And uh, of course we can expect the same like in many other regions. So the, the uh, problem is not only that Russia like uh, multiply uh, these actions in different regions, but that Russia is like uh, putting on the question uh, all the international order and uh, probably in some, um, in some regard, we need to reinvent uh, the international uh, legal platform and uh, to reinvent some uh, practices and documents and to um, rethink the approach which international community used uh, before and to reestablish the order on, on, on the seas like in maritime uh, domain. Okay. Uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, I want to ask a question that please for all the panelists and try to answer within 20, 30 seconds. Is there going to be an incident at sea, Sea of Azov, Black Sea, a Russian provocation this year? And if so, what would it be? Uh, Andri, okay. you first. So <clears throat> Russian is not, Russians are not thinking in a linear way. They always have scenarios, they always have options. And uh, so we cannot actually say clearly what is going to happen because there are always uh, there are always options, and those options will depend on how the international community reacts, how Ukraine is united itself, how Ukraine is united with international community, how do they see the coherent effort, what Europe is doing, and including what is the reaction and what is the position of the uh, U.S. administration. All these things we will we will see in dynamic. And their their activities would be opportunistic based on those dynamics. So, but yes, there might, and the uh, the 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 the, uh, the threat is uh, is is real. Okay, thank you, Admiral. Okay. Uh, thank you for from my military point of view. Uh, I think what uh, some uh, some kind of operations uh, uh, from sea at sea uh, are likely as. Uh, probability of them are higher, and first of all, some some kind of combined comprehensive uh, amphibious operations because our vulnerabilities are there, as well as some mix of uh, sabotage information uh, warfare and uh, law intensive operations uh, up to Serpent Island uh, Caesar and some operations against. Uh, uh, a chunk of uh, area region, uh, this keynote, river, sea keynote, and others. Uh, but uh, I think they should pay more attention to our southern direction and uh, particular uh, some possible Russian actions from sea. Okay, thank you. Ben? Uh, 20 seconds. Absolutely. Uh, there is going to be uh, kinetic uh, activity. It's going to be, um, it, and it won't be like an incident at sea. It's going to be a deliberate operation um, aimed at uh, probably um, the the canal area, but I think there's going to be something happening over by Odessa. I'm I'm concerned about Russian infiltration of uh, Odessa, the business people there, and um, that uh, I think we have a vulnerability there. But all of that will be to draw attention away from Azov and from Mariupol and Berdansk. That's, I think that's the main objective in this next phase. Thank you. Alina, last word is yours on this question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I 
my answer is yes, I also do expect it. And I think that it would be end of August, September, probably because of a few reasons. Because first of all, we have a summit of Crimean platform establishing summit and Russia obviously will react on this. Uh, the second, we have election in Russia this autumn. And do not forget that always when they have an election, they try to, you know, relocate the focus of attention on some small uh, war. And the third one, uh, this is announced exercises of Russians on, on this uh, September, so it, and it should be quite huge. So all these issues are just like uh, showing us that we, it is quite highly probable, I would say yes. Thank you all very much for a wonderful discussion. My own answer to that question is that Moscow will huff and will puff, but will not actually act. Because I think Biden will remind Putin in Geneva that the US is strongly behind Ukraine. We will be doing more on the Black Sea. And now that we're getting out of the post-pandemic period, we're entering the post-pandemic period, the Atlantic Council hopes at some point in the next 12 months to bring a program to Mariupol. So I'll thank you very much for joining us today and there'll be more to come.